Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. If Park Valley Church has been a blessing to you, we would like to encourage you to partner with us financially so that we can continue to spread the good news globally. You can do that online by heading over to our website at parkvalleychurch.com and clicking on the giving button at the top. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoy today's message. Hey guys, how's it going? So <clears throat> it's been an amazing week. You know, God has just done some amazing things in this church. And one of the things that I want to start doing is I want to start celebrating what God does and giving him glory. I've always been, yeah, praise the Lord. Um, I've always been, you know, I go right into the message, so center or talk, you know, or whatever. And rather than that, you know, what I'd rather do is just say a couple things. First of all, this past Tuesday, uh, I was invited over to a home. Actually, it was Howard and Beth Curtis had a get together with 31 teenagers. Many of them were graduating seniors. And they had it at another family member's home. And so we went over there, and I got a chance to just preach to them, talk to them, spend time with them. And at the end of the night, 10 teenagers gave their life to Jesus Christ. It was amazing. It was an incredible night. To God be the glory. Also, there's a ministry in our church called Clothes for Kids. And a lot of times you're going to find bins at the, in the hallway as you come in. And the reason the bins are there is because we have lots of extra clothes and so um, if you wouldn't mind just taking your, the extra clothes, especially the clothes that you have for kids, and putting them in the bins whenever we have the clothes drives, um, this past Saturday and past Tuesday, uh, Clothes for Kids gave out 450 bags of clothes to, to folks just in this local area. I'm not kidding. It was amazing. <clears throat> Thank you for filling up the bins with clothing and, and making a donation and being generous. That, that is awesome. Um, they also have sent clothes out to, matter of fact, I believe they touched 160 families. Uh, they sent clothes to Honduras and to Manila in the Philippines. And so far this year, they have passed out 1,000 bags of clothes to people in the local area. So we are praising the Lord for that and that ministry. Um, last Sunday, we had the groundbreaking. 250 people showed up. <laughs> it was crazy. I mean... All the people that were there, we had Pete Canlin there, our supervisor. We had uh, a lot of representatives from all the companies that are helping us do this project. And they're looking at us going, uh, this is a lot of people. I don't know that I've ever seen this many people at a groundbreaking. Uh, but that's just kind of the way this church is. And um, so we had a blast. And um, the cool thing about it is, since the groundbreaking this past week, everything has been satisfied with the county. Every fee, everything is done. <clears throat> and so on Tuesday, what we're going to do is we're going to have surveyors come out, and then on Wednesday, uh, hopefully on Wednesday, maybe Thursday, but on Wednesday, we're going to have Hazel come out, and uh, uh, William A. Hazel, and they're going to start doing the erosion, or the environmental erosion controls with the silt fencing and, and all that stuff, and then it won't be long, and we're going to see big old Tonka trucks all over the place. So really, really excited about that. Uh, that things are going to happen. Also, last weekend in our service on Sunday, 11 people gave their lives to Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And so we also had a couple people baptized. And uh, so it's just been, you know, God is just doing it all. I mean, it's amazing what the Lord has done since 2003, the summer of 2003 when we started, how he's brought together a family here that gets it. I mean, you guys get it. You guys understand what this is all about. It's about uh, telling people that Jesus saves and that Jesus puts lives back together again. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're doing a series called Epicenter. And the reason is because God made every single one of us with a center. And by the way, let me just say this really fast. We have a phenomenal opportunity next weekend. Um, our, our opportunity next weekend is we as a church get to meet in our own building next weekend. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I'm so excited about it. Um, the reason is because I guess it's the last weekend before school and so Battlefield is not going to allow us to use the building. And so um, what we're going to do is have a little bit of holy chaos next weekend. <laughs> now, I like holy chaos. A little bit of chaos every once in a while is a good thing. You know, because what it does is, is it just gets everybody excited, and hopefully in the right way, uh, not, you know, in an angry way. But uh, what, what we're trying to do next weekend is, is we're going to add a service. And so we're going to have an 8.30 service, have our 10 o'clock service, have our 11.30 service, which is this one. 
and then we're going to also have a one o'clock. Now, here's what I want to ask you to do. The last service, 10 o'clock, I asked those people, would you be willing to pray about, think about, maybe going over to 8.30? I said, would you do it? And I'm going to tell you, almost everybody raised their hands. I thought, man, we're going to get crushed at 8.30. Um, but I wanted to ask you guys at 11.30, would you guys think about, pray about, maybe grabbing uh, a lunch and then coming over to the one o'clock service for one weekend? How many of you guys would think about it? Raise it up. Okay, good. Thank you so much. This is not going to be a big deal, all right? Come to church next weekend. Uh, four services. It's going to work out. It's going to be amazing. There's always a really good vibe over at our building anyway, so we'd love for you guys to come out and be a part of it. Now, God made, us with, made every single one of us with a center. And w- basically what's going to happen is this. We're all going to get to the place in our lives where we ask two questions. The first question we're going to ask is this. What's the point? <laughs> we're going to get to the place in our life where we ask the question, what is the point? What am I trying to do? What's the purpose? Then we're going to also get to the place in our life where we ask the question, what is it or who is it that can help me hold it all together? because it ain't easy. It's tough. Life can be challenging at times. And so um, God made us with a center so that we would choose him, so that we would choose Jesus to be at the center of our lives. And the moment we put Jesus at the center of our life, he just wants, wants to look at us and go, proved it. He just wants to say, I told you I could keep your life together. He literally just wants to prove it, that he can hold everything together. Now, there's one verse in the Bible that is probably the greatest resume ever written when it comes to holding a life together. We looked at this verse last weekend. Colossians 1.17 says two very simple things on Jesus' resume when it comes to holding lives together. Number one, it says this, he existed before everything else began. That means that he's never had a beginning. He'll never have an ending. That means that he's always existed. That means that he's God in the flesh. That means that he has all wisdom and all experience when it comes to holding people's lives together, all right? So, how many times, and we said this last weekend, but how many times have you as a parent looked at your child and say, uh, hello, I know what it's like to be a teenager. I've been there, right? Hey, God is looking at us saying, uh, I'm from everlasting to everlasting. I got this. I know what I'm doing. I've got experience. Put me at the center of your life. Second thing that he says in this verse when it comes to a resume, it's absolutely amazing. He's already holding all of creation together. (laughs) He's got experience. When I read that, I literally said to myself, if he can hold all of creation together, he can hold Barry together. I want Jesus at the center of my life. Now, you may be sitting back and saying things like, okay, great, sure. He holds people's lives together. Got it. Congratulations. What happens when your life's already in a thousand pieces? What happens when you're already broken? Question, Barry pastor, whatever. Here's a question for you. If your life is already broken, and if you put Jesus at the center of it, will he put it back together? What do you think I'm going to say? Yeah, exactly. Duh. I'm going to say duh. (laughs) Of course he is. We always used to say, we get away from some of the stuff we used to do. We, We always used to say at Park Valley, we don't say amen. We say no duh. All right. Everybody, instead of going amen, everybody goes no duh. Jesus put lives back together again. Now, the person that would say, you know, the person that would say that their life is broken would probably ask the question, how do you know that, right? How do you know it? Well, because Paul wrote a letter to a whole bunch of broken people that after they put Jesus at the center of their life, their lives got put back together in a miraculous fashion. And I can tell you this, I have seen it myself over and over in my lifetime my life, and other people's lives, how Jesus puts lives back together again. He has that ability to do that. Now, the letter I'm talking about is a letter called Ephesians. Look at the way the Bible describes Ephesians, all of the Ephesians pre-Christianity or before Jesus. Now, when you read this verse, it's easy to sit back and say, oh, those Ephesians, man, what a bunch of evil freaks. I'm going to tell you something. We're all evil freaks. This verse describes everybody in this room, all right? Pre-Jesus, pre-Christian. Here's what it says. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Well, you were, now that you have Jesus at the center of life, it's not true. But before that happened, pre-Christian days, you were dead. 
You were doomed forever. Why? Because of your many sins. Can I just say a side note here? Sin will always bring death and doom. And that's really all it's ever going to bring. Sometimes people will look at sin and say, hey, I got a shot here. I got a shot at some happiness. I got a shot at some joy. I got a shot at making it happen. I got a shot at some success and some fulfillment. Let me tell you something. If it's sin, it's not going to happen. And I'm not trying to be Johnny Raincloud. I'm just saying the truth of the matter is sin brings death and doom. And that sounds Johnny Raincloudish, but it's good to be able to understand what the truth is. It will never bring you life. It will never bring you hope ever. It brings death and it brings doom. And then it says this, you used to live like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan. Now, kind of a bold statement, but rarely do people walk around saying, hi everyone, my name is Barry. I obey Satan. He's amazing. I mean, nobody says that. (laughs) Nobody has a shirt that says obeying Satan, you know, on it or whatever. Maybe a few people, but very, very few. As a matter of fact, I've never seen one. One thing I would say about that is this, you know, if you're not obeying God, there's only one other person to obey. And it sounds mean and it sounds in your face, but he was basically saying, before Jesus is at the center of your life, there's really only one person that you're obeying. And can I say this about obeying Satan? You weren't made to obey Satan. You weren't made to. You were made to obey God, glorify God, and serve God. Let me give you a definition of brokenness. A definition of brokenness is very simply this, and I looked it up. Here's what it said. Not functioning properly. If something is not functioning properly, then it is broken. If you are not functioning properly when it comes to your life, if you're obeying the wrong person, then you're broken because you weren't made for that. You know, um, it's the same thing when it comes down to verse 3. It says, uh, all of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. You were not made to follow the passions and desires of your evil nature. You were not made to do that. You cannot physically handle it, emotionally handle it, or mentally handle it. Every single time you go over or I go over into that realm, we are on our way towards being in a thousand pieces because we cannot cope with that. What does it mean? It just basically means that we are not functioning properly, and if we're not functioning properly, then we're broken. Let me give you an example of that. Some people will say, and listen, you know, whatever. Every single person has weaknesses. Every single person struggles with something. We all do. Everyone does. But sometimes people will, you know, for whatever reason, want to put alcohol at the center of their life. You know, people will do that. And they don't think it that way. They don't think of it like alcohol is at the center of my life. I mean, nobody's going to say that. But the truth of the matter is this. A person that lives their life that says, look, I need alcohol to wind me down from work. I need alcohol to help me have fun on the weekend. I need alcohol to help me forget my problems and the stress that I'm dealing with at home at work. I need, I mean, literally, it just goes on and on and on. It goes from social drinking to my life begins to revolve around it. I have to have it. It, it, it's, It's required for me to hold it all together. And literally all it is is, is somebody somebody taking the wrong thing and putting it at the center of their life to hold their life together, and it just doesn't work. So what basically happens eventually is this. After a while, physically you can't handle it because your liver gives out, you know, or your pancreas doesn't make it, or whatever it may be. Fill in the blank when it comes to the, the physical problems. And literally, God is saying, look, I didn't say don't drink. I just said don't get drunk. Don't make it the center of your life. I'm telling you right now, physically, you were not made to make that the center of your life. What you're literally doing is not functioning properly, and it always leads to brokenness. It's the same thing when it comes to emotion. Some people may say, well, I want to get involved in sexual immorality. Well, you were not emotionally equipped to be involved in sexual immorality. You're not. You cannot do it. You cannot possibly handle the guilt that comes with sexual immorality. You can't shoulder that weight. You're going to go crazy. It's going to drive you nuts. You're going to break and fall apart. You cannot possibly handle the emotional attachment that you have with each person. And we have kids in here, so what I'll say is that you have relations with. Wink, wink, wink. (laughs) You know what that means, right? You cannot possibly, you cannot possibly have this 
there is an emotional connection when you have relations with someone that you, you cannot possibly even imagine. There is a connection there. So people form a connection, they break it off. Connection, break it off. Connection, break it off. Over and over and over, God says this, you're going to break. You're going to fall apart. You weren't made for that. Emotionally, physically, mentally, in any way, shape, or form. Hey, you know what you're doing? You're not functioning properly, and it always leads to brokenness. I'm guaranteeing that my life's going to break apart when I do something I wasn't created to do. I was put on this earth to obey God, glorify God, and serve the God who made me. Let me tell you why. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Incredible verse. I love it. It says this. For we are God's masterpiece. If you ever get to the place in your life where you feel insecure and you don't feel like you're measuring up for whatever reason, just say to yourself, maybe say it out loud, I'm a masterpiece. (laughs) Maybe it's a little weird if you're in a store or something. You're walking around saying, I'm a masterpiece. But you know what? The truth of the matter is, God made you and he made you a masterpiece. What does that mean? It means he made you the way you are so that you could specifically do a list of things that he has created for you to do even before you were thought of. Literally, there is a list of things that the God of the universe made you and he made you the way he made you so that you could do these things and these things were on a list before you were even a thought, before you were born, before you were around. That tells you how intentional God is to make you. That tells you how valuable you are how important you are to this whole, you know, moving the kingdom of God forward and truly having a fulfilled life. Totally the opposite and the antithesis of a broken life. God brings wholeness. You know, we have a tendency a lot of times to just take broken things and throw them by the wayside. God has a tendency to take broken things and fix them and mend them and, and make them valuable again. And of course, we never lose our value, but just make them you know, effective again. And that's what, that's what God does. That's how he operates. And so, again, the part, second part of the verse says he's created a new, you a new in Christ Jesus so that, you know, we can do the good things that he planned for us to do a whole long time ago. So here's the thing. Ephesians is a book that shows us this process of how a whole bunch of broken people put Jesus at the center of their life and slowly but surely, Jesus took the broken pieces and put them back together again and healed them. And it's just an amazing thing. People that were dead, doomed, weak, rejected, and betrayed became whole again and effective. And I just think, I know he can do the same for you. And I know he can do the same for me. So how does he do it? Okay, a couple ways. Number one, first thing he does is, is he brings you close to God. He brings you close to him. Trust me, the only person that can shrink the distance between A sinful person and a holy God is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that does it. We can't get there on our own. We've learned that over and over. That's just a great way to get stressed out. The only way you're going to get to a holy God is through Jesus. He's the one that that closes the gap and bridges the gap between us and God. Now, God is described as a trinity, right? He's described as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And every time we hear that, we scratch our heads and say, that doesn't make sense. And I can't get up here and say, well, let me uh, devise a formula to show you the Trinity. And you see, he's three separate persons, yet one God. You know? So everybody's going to go, yeah, okay, well, that doesn't make any sense. Literally, every single illustration that I could ever come up with, there's a flaw in it. Because it's a miracle that he is three separate persons, but he is one God. He's only one God. I mean, all you have to do is look in the first chapter of Genesis. In the Bible, literally God himself is saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The average person is going to scratch their head and say, okay, so who's us, our, and our? Because that sounds like a plurality. And it is a plurality. Because he's referring to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three separate people, yet one person. Over in Matthew, the Bible says, you need to baptize them. You baptize them in the N-A-M-E singular, name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So it's one person, but it's three separate persons that they're referring to. It's just a miracle. When Jesus, in the book of John, was having a conversation with Philip, and Philip looks at him and he says, I want to see the Father, 
And Jesus is basically like going, hello, Phil, I'm right here. How long have I been with you? That's literally what he said, right? How long have I been with you? And you say you want to see the Father? He said, if you have seen me, you have seen who? You've seen the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. Jesus is looking at Philip saying this, I'm God. Colossians said that he is the physical image of the invisible God. Literally, that's who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh. And so he teaches us, do we see the word Trinity in the Bible? No, you don't. Do you see the teachings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Yes, you do. All through the Bible. And you say, okay, so great. Congratulations. Why'd you bring it up? The bottom line is because all three persons are involved in putting your life back together. And they put the Ephesians' life back together. Took a bunch of broken, shattered pieces and took the glue of things like love and trust and, and security and, and, and all of these things and put their lives back together. You see, it's easy for me as a pastor to stand up in front of you today and say, hello, everyone, have Jesus at the center of your life and they'll put it back together. Let's pray. But it takes a little bit more study to dive in and find out the actual ways that he does it and the things that he does in your life to really put your life back together. We're not talking about metaphors. We're talking about reality. He will put it together. He will bring you back from whatever discouragement that you're in. If you think your life is over, it's not over. Because Jesus can, can heal anything at any situation. And so... You say, okay, so why is that step number one? Because where there is brokenness, I guarantee you, where there is brokenness, there's weakness. Where there is brokenness, there's betrayal. Where there is brokenness, there is rejection. Every single time, there's rejection. There's betrayal. There's weakness. What does God do? Through the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, he gives us the opposite of every single one of those things. The closer I get to God, the more strength that he gives me to combat that weakness. The closer I get to God, I realize that I have a relationship with somebody that I can trust totally in my life. I can trust Jesus no matter what. The closer I get to God, the more I realize that I have the ability now to tap into this incredibly unending reservoir of basically unconditional love that is going to nourish me beyond belief. Every single one of these things are what are putting my life back together. Unconditional love and trust and strength. Look what he says, Ephesians. That's our book today. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. He says it to a whole bunch of broken people. By the way, what's he say in chapter 1? Chapter 1, he says, this is your position. Chapter 2, he says, you're dead. You were doomed. The other part of chapter 2 says, famous verse, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. So they get saved. Jesus is at the center. Chapter 3, what's he talk about? The three persons of the Godhead, how they do the opposite things when it comes to brokenness in our life. He says, verse 16, I pray that from his glorious and limited resources, he's going to give you mighty strength through his Holy Spirit. I pray that his Christ will be, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts so that you can trust him. And I pray that your roots are going to go down deep in the soil of God's marvelous love. He talks about a strength. That word strength in the Greek basically refers to an ability that you didn't previously have. Before the Holy Spirit of God came to live inside of you, you didn't have certain abilities. But now that he lives inside of you, he has given you strength. He has given you abilities. When it comes to Jesus, it's a relationship where you can trust him no matter what. And when it comes to God the Father, he says, look, I love you, period, for you unconditionally. You know, when I think about the strength part of it, you know, I think about the, the, the times in my life where, I mean, let's face it, relationships are difficult. And I say this all the time. And I think I saw my wife over there to the left. Is that you, Chris? Yeah, I think it is. I don't know. If it isn't, golly days, that's creepy. <laughs> I hope it's my wife. If not, it's her twin. My, my voice is cracking. It's her twin. <laughs> so here's the deal. I mean, you know, every relationship is, is tough. And, you know, we've been married for 29 years, and, and there have been times we didn't think we were going to make it. And you're thinking, oh, great, our pastor is like a freak. He, his marriage is on the rocks, and he's our pastor. 
It's a terrible thing. Is he even going to be here next week? Is it going to work out? You know. <laughs> what I would say to you is, we're in a good place, okay? We're in a good place. <laughs> but there are times in relationships where literally when you don't have that strength, it's just easier to quit. It's just easier to quit. But with the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you, you say, you know what? I've got a strength I didn't used to have. And these are all things that kind of keep your life together. You know what I mean? When it comes to just everything that's going on with relationships and challenges and work and just everything. I've got to have his strength. If I don't have it, I'm up a creek. Because we're not going to make it. I told you. I mean, I told you last week, you know, that the, the only reason I'm still married is because of the grace of Jesus. The only reason I'm a pastor and standing in front of you is because of the grace of Jesus. The only reason I have anything is because of the provision of Jesus. It is literally all Jesus. I have nothing to do with it. It is all him and his grace and his power and his strength, period. That is it. So it's just a strength that every single one of us need. Um, It's the same thing when it comes to a desire or a temptation or an evil desire that flares up in my life. Oh, yeah, it's simple to just say, you know what? I'm giving in. I can't do this. But you know what? Now I got a strength that I didn't used to have. And I'm not going to give in to an evil desire. I'm not doing it. I'm sick and tired of, of the fact that every time I make a decision like that, all it does is ruin and wreck and destroy other people or me or whoever it may be. No, I'm not doing it. I've got a strength I didn't used to have. And I'm depending on that. What's happening? I'm going to tell you something. Your life is coming together. It's coming together. It's becoming stronger than ever because it's not your strength. It's the same thing when things don't work out and it's just easier to lose hope or it's easier to say, you know what? I don't even want to live anymore. That's easy to say. But now it's, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give up. I've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of me, giving me a strength I've never had before. and I love it. And I need it. And that's in the Bible. That's what he says. The Holy Spirit of God gives us a strength. What's he doing? Mortar, gorilla glue. He's putting your life back together. Same thing when it comes to trust. Look, the average person's gonna say, you know what, I'm up, forget trust. I've been betrayed so many times, forget it. Bottom line is this. My philosophy, if Jesus loves me enough to die for me, I'm gonna trust him. If he will give his life so that I can have life, I will trust Jesus. And the bottom line is this. You know, you know, we talked about it last weekend. There's two kinds of people on this earth. You've got givers and takers. Jesus is a giver. Jesus looks at every one of us in the eye and basically says this, I don't want anything from you. I just want to give you life. Not just life, but I want to give you a fulfilling life, an amazing life. And I want to give you life right now. I want to give that to you. He is a giver. Listen, trust him. He's not going to bait and switch you. He's not going to, you know, hurt you or anything like that. He's got you. He loves you. He's going to protect you. Trust in him. Feel at home with him in your heart. Third thing is, you know, I, I always have this unending reservoir of unconditional love. The Bible says that your roots are supposed to go down deep into God's love. Listen, face it. Love is the most nourishing thing you will ever have in your life. We're all craving love. You will never meet a person that doesn't want to be loved. Everybody wants love, and we're all looking for love. <laughs> Sounds like a country song. Looking for love in all the wrong places or whatever. But. And that's true, too, actually. That's another whole message. Maybe a series. <sighs> Here's the thing. And, I, and I, this is TMI, and it embarrasses my wife, I'm sure. You know, but I will say a lot of times to her, rather than just say, hey, give me a kiss, I will say, hey, give me some go power. I need some go power, right? Give me some go power because I don't know what it is, but it just fills me up. It nourishes me. It encourages me. It strengthens me. And everybody's looking for love. Do you know what? I looked this up online. The number one selling genre of book in America. Can anybody guess? Let me give you a hint. It's not horror. Can anybody guess what it would be? Romance. Wow, amazing. You guys, how'd you know that? $1.4 billion in sales. You know why? People are looking for love. Love is something that nourishes us. And God says this, I have an unending supply of unconditional love for you. 
root deep in it. So the next time a storm comes, you'll stand firm. The next time you feel insecure, you know that love will be there. It will nourish you. It will hold you up. What's he doing? He's putting our life back together again. Number two, he connects me with a family. Sometimes people look at church and they think, eh, it's kind of like a chore to go to church. People are like, oh, let's get the kids ready. We got to go to church. We're running late. Who cares? As long as we show up, wave to a few people, go out the side door, whatever. Check the box. I'm going to tell you this. Church is a lot more than a chore. It's a family. We are a family at Park Valley Church. And yeah, it's kind of weird. You know, we hang out at 1130. We meet in a school. You know, but I guess we got to have a place to gather, right? That's why it's not about the building. A church has literally nothing to do with the building. It has everything to do with the people that are here. You are longing to connect with a group of people. You are longing to connect with a family. So what does Jesus do? He says, I'm going to bring you close to the Father, and then I'm going to connect you with a family because you need that. Know this. Your spiritual family is going to outlast your physical family. We are going to be, here's the deal. Literally, this is the preschool. Remember how we always call this the kindergarten of the preschool? We're learning how to get along with each other now because we're going to be with each other forever. (laughs) Huh? Isn't that awesome? Tell you what, look at your neighbor right now and say these words. You're stuck with me. (laughs) Yeah. You're stuck with me. Hey, we're going to be together forever. Here's what the Bible says about it. Ephesians 4.4. We're all one body. Same spirit. Same glorious future. Same Lord. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father who is over us all, in us all, living through us all, well, we're all together. Doesn't take long to go back in time. Like even in the 80s when I was in high school, I look back and I think, well, you know, you had the jocks and the nerds and the preps and the whatever. And, and today I wrote down a few. I don't even know if these are real gamers, grungers, skaters, goths, emos, whatever. We look at things like that and we think, oh, that's just weird. Oh, weird. It's not weird. It's normal. It's normal. Why? Because people want to connect with somebody. People want to be with a lot of other people like them. And people want to have a group and a family to be with because that's how God made us. He made us to be connected to a family. And Jesus, when he begins to put our life back together again, connects us with a family and it's called his body. So he says, how do you operate within a family? He gives you a little list, just like you would any family, right? Chapter four, verse 25, he says, tell the truth. Tell the truth to everybody. He says, chapter 4, verse 26, control your anger. How many of you believe anger ruins relationships? Anybody believe that? Yeah, it does, because it's weird. Anger's weird. It's one of those weird things we talk about. Chapter 4, verse 28, be honest and generous. Verse 29, encourage others. Literally, that's God's way of looking at us saying this. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. You thought your mom came up with that. She didn't. She got it from God. God literally said, make sure that the words you use are to lift people up and to encourage people. Want to get along in a family? Do that. Then it says this, verse 32, forgive people. The most important thing that you will do in relationships is to forgive. And you're going to think they don't deserve it. I'm letting them off the hook. They got to suffer. They got to bleed a little bit. No, get out of the bleeding business. Let God take care of the bleeding. (laughs) Let God take care of whatever he does. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. That's God's way of saying, you let it go and I'll get even. I keep perfect books. That's what God says. So you let it go and you deliver yourself. Why? Because we're a family and somebody's going to get offended. Right? That's part of it. Somebody's going to get offended. And so Jesus continues to put my life back together by connecting me to a family And then he teaches me how to get along with the family and how to operate in the context of that family. Number three, he brings health to my most important relationships. Listen, if you're having trouble in your marriage, that's pretty much all you're going to think about. If you have trouble with one of your children, you're going to think about that when you go to bed. That's going to be the first thing you think about when you get up in the morning. And it's probably what you're going to think about all day at work. And so these things have a tendency to kind of consume you 
when it comes to all the other responsibilities that you have in your life, you get consumed. So what does Jesus say? Hey, we're going to put you back together. Put me at the center. Get close to God. Get all these things that are literally the opposite of what brokenness brings. Connect with a family. Now I want you to work on all the most important relationships that you have right now so that you can be, so you can have health in every single one of these relationships. Jesus literally begins be putting my life back together again by strengthening the relationships. So what does he say? He says all kinds of things, like husbands, love your wife sacrificially. Wives, respect him. Respect your husbands. Parents, don't provoke your kid to wrath. That word provoke means to come alongside your child. Literally, it means I am angry alongside my child that will cause them to be angry and probably one day lose hope. Kids, obey your parents. Employees, work hard like you're working for God. Employers, make sure you treat your employees with kindness and respect. Because trust me, and this is God looking at all the employers saying, trust me, you both have a boss. And it's me. That's what God says. That's literally what he's saying. What is Jesus doing? He is putting our lives back together again in a real way. I'm not up here talking about metaphors. I'm talking about real, tangible ways that Jesus begins cementing your life back together again. All the broken pieces, all the hurt, all the rejection, all the betrayal, all the loneliness. He starts fixing it. And then what does he do? The last thing is this. He says, now I want you to go after the source of all this brokenness. And I want you to put on the armor of God. And I want you to learn how to defend yourself. And I want you to learn how to go on the attack. And I want you to go after the one that is causing and the source of all this hurt and brokenness and sin. And I want you to go to war. I want you to go to battle. That's exactly what we do. Once my life is slowly put back together again, I become strong in Jesus. And he gives me the opportunity to go to war, in a sense, with the one who has caused all this brokenness in the first place. And he gives me this stuff called the armor of God. And he basically says, Barry, I want you to surround yourself with truth. Because truth always wins out over lies. And I want you to take the body armor of righteousness, which is basically this. Every time I make a decision that is consistent with the nature of who my father is in heaven. It's as if I have taken Kevlar and put it across my chest. It's as if I have taken armor, body armor, and protected myself. Why? Because people look at me and say, oh, oh, well, I, can, I can tell who your father is. I can tell. I can see it in the way you live your life. I can see it in the decisions that you make. That armor of righteousness, the shoes of peace, to be able to stand firm, have firm footing in the middle of a battle that quite frankly scares you to death. But I'm not retreating. I'm standing here firm. I got the my my shoes of the I'm fitted with the shoes of the gospel of peace. I ain't budging. The gospel is what helps me stand with courage in the middle of a battle, just like when David walks up against an over nine foot tall giant and stands there with confidence. Matter of fact, the Bible says he ran towards Goliath. Who would do that? Somebody with a whole lot of courage and confidence. Same thing for us. We're going to be in a battle. We are in a battle. We need to stand there with the shoes of peace. Take the shield of faith. God is our shield. If God is this lectern, it basically means this. I go like this. And every once in a while, I may go like this. I'm hanging back here behind God. I'm going to have God take the fiery darts. Not me. I follow him. I go where he goes. I submit to his will. I trust in him. I'm right behind my father. You see, every time you do that, you have a shield. And it protects you. I'm going to take the helmet of salvation because no fatal blow will come to me. My head is protected. I've got salvation. My mind is protected. My soul is protected. And I'm going to take the sword of the spirit. Every single time... Satan tried to tempt Jesus. He came back with the the first three words, always. It is what? 
written. It is written. He used the sword of the Spirit every time he was attacked by the enemy. And you say, okay, so when do I use the sword of the Spirit you're talking about? Every time somebody questions your identity in Jesus, pull out the sword. Yeah, no duh. I love that. Every time, every time you feel inadequate, every time you feel insecure, every time you feel overwhelmed by fear, pull out the sword. Do you think it's a coincidence that Satan started his temptations with these words, if you are the son of God? He questioned his identity. He's going to do the same with you. Who are you? You think you're in Jesus? Sword? Oh, I am in Christ. And I can do all things through Christ. And he will never leave me or forsake me. And he has saved my soul. He has given me eternal life. His blood has washed me clean. Don't lie to me. I've got the truth. Use the sword of the Spirit. Fight the one who's bringing all this brokenness in the first place. A person who has no hope and a broken life finds out that Jesus can put it all back together again. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? If you're here today, and you would say this, just by an uplifted hand, you'd say this, no one's looking, no one's looking, but you would raise your hand right now and you would say this, Barry, pray for me, my life is broken. Would you raise it up? Wow, lots of hands, lots of hands. I pray for every single heart behind every hand that just went up, every single person right now that made a decision to say, my life is broken. I pray for my life, Lord, that is broken, our lives that are broken. Jesus, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would begin to put our lives back together again, that you would give us the strength that we need, that you would give us a relationship of trust, that you would help us to tap into this unending, unconditional reservoir of love that you offer us, absolutely no strings attached. God, may it put our lives back together again and nourish us and strengthen us, Lord. God, I pray for our homes. I pray for um, our connection with your body. I pray for our effectiveness on the battlefield. God, all of these different things, Lord, we lift up to you and we claim by faith that you're going to put these lives back together again. You're going to do it. I honestly believe it. And I pray this in Jesus' name with heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're here and you've never accepted Christ. I'm gonna give you a chance right now to give your life to Christ. Just simple, it's very simple. It's faith. Believing a story called the gospel. The story is simple. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the dead. That's it. You get to believe it. You can choose right where you sit to believe it. I'm gonna give you a chance to tell God right now that you believed it. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know this. I believe, I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe three days later he rose from the dead and did it for me. I admit it, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Please forgive me, please wash me clean. Please change my life because I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen.